Hi, everyone. As you all are connecting to your audio, oh, now I can see it. As you all are connecting to your audio, just please make sure that uh, you have your cameras on. We would love to see your faces. I know our presenters and speakers would love to see your beautiful faces. Uh, and also, if you have any questions, uh, make sure that you either drop in the chat or you raise your hand. Do not take yourself off of mic or do not take yourself off of mute unless one of us say that it's okay. Uh, and then as well as um, emails. So you should have gotten the email from me, um, just kind of outlining sponsorship details, registration, uh, where the recordings will be located, um, all of that information. You should be able to now have that in that email and where all those different uh, items are located. Okay, so if you have any questions about where any of those items are, just email me. Um, if, if you're here, then you definitely got the email from me. So just email that same email address um, that you received from me. And yeah, I think that is all of our housekeeping items. And I will go ahead and stop talking as much and just introduce our speakers today and what we'll be talking about. So of course, we're going to be talking about the actuary profession and career pathways as well. Tiling people in also. Um, but in fact, I'll go ahead and just kick it over to WTW. So we have three wonderful people here today that are you know excited to connect and to speak with you both. We do have two presenters, but we do have Ms. Anjane Lance here as well, and she has, you know, hosted past boot camps as well. So I'll go ahead, like I said, and stop talking and just go ahead and pass it over to you all, and you all can introduce yourselves and what we're doing here today. Anyone? Um, I can start. Um, Anjane Lance, I think I've met some of you. Um, through previous boot camps or just IABA, it's an annual meeting, things like that. Um, I am currently studying to be an actuary as long as I get some results back in a couple of months, I'll have my ASA. Um, and then I'm gonna start studying for my FSA as a health actuary. So if you guys have any questions, I'm not presenting today, um, more so just here for support and to help answer questions. So um, feel free to let me know. Yeah. Good, I can go next. Hello, everyone. I'm Carmen. I've uh, been with WTW for almost four years now. I'm in the international team, and later on in the presentation, I will tell you all about what I do as an international consultant. Uh, I'm a ASA, and I'm currently studying the health and benefit tracks to become a FSA. All right, so the best for last. My name is Etienne Kaviseba. I am an actuary. I became a fellow last uh, end of last year, so I'm done with studying. I work at the, P the WTW in the, one of the PNC teams in the office out of um, New York. All right. So the main topic of the, for this bootcamp is the overview of the actuarial profession and career pathways. So we're just going to explore what being an actuary is and how to become one, essentially. So the, the agendas, that, the items that we'll go through today are basically uh, what an actuary is, the meaning of, the, of all the abbreviation, abbreviations that you may see, such as SLA, CAS, uh, CIA, and all this other abbreviation, abbreviation that you see, and what it means to become an associate, and what it means to become an in fellow and the pathways of how to, how to get there. We'll go over some traditional actuarial roles, roles, which usually includes like consulting and insurance. We'll explain what uh, we do in our daily -day life and in our roles. And we'll also explore some non-traditional roles that are out there that, that we know of, or we, that we know actuaries uh, have in, in the industry. And at the end, we'll open the floor for, for questions, but even, throughout this conversation. So if you have any questions that you like to ask, feel free to write it in the chat and I think you might be able to say it in, uh, out loud. 
All All right. All you have to do is raise your hand and we'll call on you. Thank you. All right, so does anybody know what an actuary is? Well, how would you define an actuary if someone were to ask you what an actuary was? Miles, you can go ahead if you have your answer. Hello. Um, oh, are you guys able to hear me? Am I coming through? Yep. Okay, great. Um, I would say that an actuary is someone who works for an insurance company to help them determine insurance rates. That's one that's one way to, to, to define it. There's also actuaries that don't work for insurance companies, like uh, Ajane, Carmen, and myself. I do work for a consulting company, but that's part of the definition. I would agree with that. Anybody else? So I'll say an actuary is somebody that um, uses mathematical and statistical knowledge to be able to um, calculate um, premiums and, and to be, um, so that um, the revenue for, of premiums can be over the amount of the expense of claims and also do other um, um, non-traditional uh, uh, um, some non-traditional uh, uh, methods like uh, maybe risk adjustments and maybe risk management and some depending on your um, on your role, something like that. I'll also say what an actuary is. That's also actually accurate as well. So basically there's some actuaries that for which your role is essentially to, to price risk. So whatever policies that are being offered in, in the role essentially, usually a insurance company would go reach out to actuaries to, to be able to price that to price that for them. So that's true as well. But again, there's also more that the actuaries could do. Is there anybody else that have a, any definition? If not, we could go with um, what the dictionary says, what, it, uh, what an actuary is. All right, so basically, according to this website, actuaries analyze the financial cost of risk and uncertainty. They use math, statistics, financial theory to assess risk of potential events and they help businesses and clients develop policies that minimize the cost of risk. And I like um, Miles said earlier, and actuaries work is essential to the insurance industry. That's why you see most actuaries working in insurance companies. Okay, so I will go ahead and start with the SOA. So the Society of Actuaries. So they are multiple um, actuarial organization that you will see throughout your career and that you may have already seen. So we will focus on this presentation on the two main one that we have in the US. So the SOA and the CAS, but there are also other um, actuarial organizations. So for example, the CIA in Canada or the FIA in the UK. But with, for today, we will focus on the one that are in the United States. So the SOA is uh, the largest act actuarial uh, organization that has over 30,000 me members and its goal is mainly to education and research. So as a student, you will mainly see the SOA because they are the one who are sponsoring the exams that you're taking. So that's how you will see their name. And uh, their vision is really to help the actuaries develop their skills and uh, to remain relevant and, act, and uh, offer an accurate job on a day-to-day -day basis. So they do both research and education. If we go on the next slide, we will discuss uh, the first main credentials. So there are two credentials that you can attain from the SOA. So associate and fellow. So you might have already seen the ASA and the FSA uh, credentials. So an ASA is an associate of the Society of Actuaries. And to become a, an ASA, you need to go through a series of exams, seminars, and modules. So you will see on this slide, you have 
kind of five main sections. So they changed that process recently. So although I, I didn't start a long time ago, that's not exactly the process I went through, but the principle remains the same. So you have foundation, this is really your basic. So you, they want to make sure that you have a strong mathematical basis to understand the rest. So that's where you will take your probability exam, your FM exam. These are really basic concepts that you will need to build on to be an actuary. There is also um, the two VEE. So a VEE, it's uh, the credit that you can have through school. You can also take classes directly from other places, but the easiest way is really to have a certain grade on specific classes at school. And um, the second part is actuarial one, which is building on what you learn in foundation, then actuarial two, which builds on what you learn in actuarial one in foundation, and then advanced. So you will see there are uh, different colors on the uh, exams journey. So the in blue, it's exams. In, in green is VEE, so credit that you can have to school. In yellow, that's the module. So the module is really a project that you take on that you have time to do at home. So it's usually a business problem that they give you and they ask you to answer. And then there's the seminar at the end, which is mainly a conference where they explain what is an actuary, what's your role in society, the ethics rule, the um, what rule you're supposed to follow once you become a credential actuary. So that's why this one is typically done at the end. So if we go on the next line, I will talk about the second credential that you can get. And that's the one I'm currently studying for is to become a fellow. So this is more specific to your line of work typically. So there are different track that you can select and that's that allows you to become more specialized in one field. So you will have three exams and three, ex three or four exams depending on the track where you really focus on details that you will need you, that we need a, to a certain extent on your day-to-day -day job. So there is the corporate finance, the quantitative finance and investment, the individual life insurance, the retirement benefit, the group and health insurance. So that's the one I'm currently studying for. And there is the general insurance. In the United States, it's not super common for individual to go through the SOA general insurance track. It's mainly done through the CIS that ATN will cover next, but it's also a track that's available. I will pause here to see, do you have any questions on the SOA, on the exam process? Great, I guess that's uh, clear. Oh, go ahead. I have, I have a question. So it's like you, right? You're, you're mm -hmm. doing the group and health insurance track. So what if you did the, let's say the corporate finance and ERM, which is not related with what you do? Is there, is there a problem with that? Uh, that's actually a great question. So I would say it's easier to do the track if it's related to something you work on. So for example, sometimes I would see something at work and that's actually something that I studied or I study something that I've, I've seen at work so it makes it easier to study. But at the end of the day, it's one title, let's say FSA title. So I've seen somebody do the health and benefit track and then transfer and move on to work in life insurance, for example. It's easier to, if it's related to what you do and typically employer would encourage you to, to go with a track that's related to your work, but these skills are easily transferable from one business to another. I would say the only exception to that is the one that are heavily regulated. So for example, in retirement, to be able to sign actual evaluation, you need an additional title. So someone like me who would come from h and I will need to go and get that additional certification to be able to sign. One thing that I would add to that is it also depends on your job and what business you work in. Like a lot of employers are fine with whatever you want to pursue and they're supportive, but some employer then they're going to expect that you go on a life insurance track, for example, or if you work at a health insurance company, they'll expect you to go on the health track. So also depends a little bit where you work and what your employer will support. Michael, you want to go ahead? Yeah, is it common for someone to take the quantitative finance and investment track? Uh, I would say so. At for working from experience at WTW, we have a investment investment group. 
So I would say that most people in that group take that track specifically. So I would say it depends on your line of work. Um, I've heard from friends who take it that it's harder than the other ones because it's get, it gets into like heavy calculus and um, so I've just heard that it's harder, but I don't know if that makes it any more or less common. I hear I am an actuary. I'm like, hmm, I wonder what this is. <laughs> okay, great. Um, thank you all for the questions. So I will pass it on to Etienne to cover the CAS. All right, so CAS is similar to the SOA, but however, CAS is the world's only actuarial organization that focuses exclusively on property and casualty risk. On the slide, I'll show you, you know, the, the number of members when it was founded and all that stuff. Essentially what it is, is the body that handles all the PNC actuaries or most of the PXC, PNC actuaries in the world, PNC being property and casualty. And similar to the SOA, there's two main credentials that you can, that you can get, one being the being an associate and the second being a uh, big minute fellow. Both, um, so to become, the way the way the exams is split up for, in the, in the CAS, there's three main, three sets of exams, essentially, the preliminary exams, the associate, associateship exams, and the fellowship exams. So the preliminary ex exams are you know, ex exams that, that assess to finance the, your foundation. The associateship exams are the, the exams that are needed to, to become uh, an, associ an associate. And the fellowship exams are the, the exams that are needed to become a fellow. And like the SOA, everybody usually does the same exam unless if you depending on when you started during the whole process but as long as most people do do, do 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 all these exams and they all do essentially do the same exams uh, before i go on to discuss what's an actuarial consultant did anybody have questions regarding the cas Okay, great. So Question. what Question. is, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So um, the, do WTW have a session for the um, property and casualty actuaries? Well, yes, uh, I'm a property and casualty actuary. So, and I think in, in the US at least, there's two main teams that work on property and casualty. So I'm part of one team where my team, we usually focus on hospital liability, DNO, loyalty, and a bunch of different uh, like corporate um, uh, insurance needs. Whereas there's another team, ICT, that focuses more on, like, like the title says, uh, insurance, insurance companies essentially. So yes, and WQW has has a PNC team. So PNC teams in, and that is the US and Canada. Okay, so if I, if I had to ask you what is an actuarial consultant, and I know we have a little definition here on this slide, but in your own words, what would you say an actuarial consultant does? Adrian? So the actual consultant is somebody that has expertise in an area, um, a specific area, and they have different persons that come to them to help solve any problems in those areas. I, can you say the last part again? Sorry, I didn't hear it. So I'm saying they have expertise in a specific, mm -hmm. specific area. And different companies or different persons will come to them for help and solving problems using their expertise. 
Yeah, um, that's that's a good definition. I think it's much better than what I would have said if somebody would have asked me when I was a student, what is an actuarial consultant? Um, I think the main component of being an actuarial consultant is that we support client needs. And what are client needs then it depends on what the client wants, but also in which line of business that you are. But I think one of the main components between myself, Anjane, Etienne, and all our different teams is that we support our client need. And supporting a client need, as we since we are actuaries, that's often does through that's often we often do it through data analytics, to risk management. Uh, we help them with solution, as it mentioned on the slide. So in the area of people, risk, and capital, that's kind of what we do at WTW. But an actuarial consultant can work in a lot of different space. But the main the main common area in all these fields is support client need. So um, on the slide here, we mentioned retirement, health and benefit, risk and broken, but these are just a few examples. So I will walk you through an example of what an act a health actuarial consultant is doing. And that's what I used to do when I was back in Canada before I moved to the United States and joined their international team that I will talk to you a, a little bit more about in a few slides. So a health actuarial consultant help uh, companies with their benefits. So if I ask you, uh, what do you know about employee benefits? Can you name me a few employee benefits that comes to mind? I don't know who had their hand up first. Um, <laughs> we'll go with pa Pascal. I hope I'm saying your name right. Yeah, Pascal. Um, I would say pension in terms of employee benefits or 403B? Yeah, that's that's a good one. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sandra, did you did you want to, was that your answer? Did she take your That's answer? what I wanted to say, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, okay. And then, oh, and some like Dorcas, is that how you say your name? Yeah, that's how to say it. Dorcas. Dorcas, okay. Yes, so, uh, who's your answer? workers' compensation. Okay, yeah, that, that's that's also a good one. That's also a good one. That actually, the both that were named are not one that are handled specifically by the health and benefit team, but these are good examples. So uh, the workers' competition is kind of a tricky one because it falls in, part of it is uh, employee benefit and part of it is kind of priority and casualty insurance because it's often led, to, often due to accidents. So in the United States, kind of one that comes in the middle. So it's handled by the PNC team for to help with support. And in Canada, for example, where I was before, that's handled by the health and benefit team. And retirement, it's so big as an employee benefit that it's actually a category all on its own. So that's why we have um, people that focus only on retirement because that's, that's its own specific section. Uh, Tommy, I believe you have a question. Uh, not, not really a question. So, but I just want, Oh, let's say it's a question because I'm not too sure. What came to my mind when you um, talked about employee benefit was like the employee sponsored healthcare, where um, some actuaries do deal with small groups, maybe one to 50, and others do with large groups, some um, large groups, maybe over 100 employees. And it, I don't know if that's part of the employee benefit. Yes, as that's actually exactly what we work with. So we support organization with the employee benefit that they want to provide to their groups. So for example, we have company ABC that wants to provide life insurance for its employees, uh, disability benefits or health insurance to cover for medical expenses. So we help company with all these different benefits. And what we do, that depends on the client need. So we can help them set the design. So we have clients that help that come to us and say, I want to put in place a health and benefit plan for a group of, 100 people, what do you recommend? So we can make suggestions based on their budget or based on their needs. So if they need to attract a certain group of employees where it's really competitive, we might say these benefits are usually the type that are really attractive in the market that can help you recruit some really high demand candidate. If it's other type of job that may be lower paying job where the employee will come to us and say, I don't have a large budget for benefit, but I wanna, sh wanna make sure that all my employees are covered for a minimum if something happens to them. So we also help them with that. But 
the uh, we are not the insurer so we are not insuring the benefits that's why we work with insurance company so we are the link between the insurance company and the client so we have company abc's that offers employee benefit through an insurer but we are in the middle to help them negotiate the rates that are going to be paid decide which insurance will be provided which insurance company fits better the needs of the client so these are the type of work that we do as a health actuarial consultant another thing that we do is to analyze plan experience and financial impact of design changes so as you may have heard on the news it it really costs a lot to cover for medical expenses the medical cost especially in the united states is really expensive so they need actuaries to help them with to do uh, financials, financial projections to help them manage the cost and manage the risk associated with offering employee benefits. And uh, two other things that we may do is uh, compliance. So um, health insurance is really regulated. So each different states has different regulation. So that's a risk for the employer. And as consultant, we help them manage these risks. So is your plan compliant to with the regulation in the country, in the state you are working with to make sure that they are not liable for fines or for um, for the uh, for fines or for the government to tell them that they, did, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. And the last one is kind of to make sure that the program is effective over time, because the employer make a lot of money, put a lot of money in the program, but sometimes with the change of workforce, with the maybe they add over more diverse population through in the employee population, it's helpful to review the program to make sure that it still meet the goal that the employer wants. So one of one example of things that they do in that team is um, DNI analysis. So make sure that the employees that the employee benefits support a diverse workforce. So depending on who's working at the company, the benefit needs may be different. So that's also something we help them analyze, analyze the market, and also analyze the price of adding all these different options. So um, does anybody have question on the health actuarial consulting? That was amazing, by the way. I learned a lot uh, <laughs> just, just that time. Um, yes, um, Pascal, I don't know if you still had a question um, or not, but your hand is still up. Uh, and okay, just wanted to make sure. And Miles, you can go ahead and answer, uh, ask your question. Um, what type of clients do actuarial consultants usually work for? Like, is it usually just companies that are trying to provide benefits for their employees or are there other types of clients as well? Uh, that's actually a great question. So it depends on which type of consultant. So a health consultant is going to work with a company that's trying to offer benefits to its employees, and it can be a small group or it can be really large companies. But a PNC actuaries for it, like Etienne, for example, we work with different type of clients that have different needs. So it can be a company that's trying to reinsure some type of special risk. So that will come to us to help them with these type of insurance. So it really depends on the client need. But I would say that we have a large portfolio of companies and that actuaries can help. I think basically every company can come to actuaries for some kind of needs. Thank you. Yep, Steve, you can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, um, I really like the part we're talking about measuring program effectiveness over time. Um, we have a bit more metrics in terms of what qualifies an effective like program in, in, in any sense. Yeah, uh, that's actually a great question. And that's the kind of thing that we help client develop. So that's where our value added is as actuaries, because actuaries, we love math. We love all these metrics and how can we actually quantify that our program is working? So we help them with employee surveys. So we will ask questions to employee to see what they value in their program. It may be that they value something that's really expensive and the, the employer is going to say okay that makes sense my employee really valued our program even if that program costs a lot but sometimes they won't value something and the employee is already putting a lot of money in that program so we will say maybe maybe you should 
offer a flex plan to employees to offer them options from which they can choose. So I will say it's effectiveness of the program is measured through um, employee satisfaction and also utilization. So sometimes you will see that the program is not effective because nobody's using it. So that's also an indicator that the program is not really effective. Thank you. Great questions, great, great questions. Anybody else have any more questions? I'm learning a lot. <laughs> no. All right, remember if you have any, raise your hand. Oh, Adrian, did you have your, a question? So my question is based on the first and um, bit uh, about certain type of job design. Say for instance, what first size is that the best job about certain type of job? Next song, Alfred Crescent. Did you hear him, Carmen? We couldn't hear you. Um, it was a little, it was breaking up a little bit. Um, it was a little muffled oh, as well. Yeah. Sorry about that. Next time. Um, so I was basically asking. Um, what first size of time would be the best, or what person would be the best to work in a consultant time job? You said what type of person? Did you hear that, Carmen? I think so. So is your question, what type of perks are the best at working as a consultant? Like, what is nice as being a consultant? As the personality. The personality oh, the type. personalities. Uh, it's a great question, and I would say we... We welcome anybody. <laughs> so the good thing about consulting is that there is a lot of different things you can do. So they are really, there are actuaries that are a bit less technical that want to have a more a client focused role. There are actuaries that are more technical that help with um, develop all the tools. So I would say the, the great thing about consulting is you can really select the path that you want to build. So if you are more technical actuary, you can really focus on that technical aspect. If you like a client presentation a little bit more, you can move your career in that direction. So I think you can really pick and choose. So I would say any personality is welcome. You said thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Um, James, did you want to ask, ask your question as well? Um, I, I want to find out um, how often do you get um, the insurance companies themselves coming to you for um, an advice about a policy probably they are bringing up? Because I know in Ghana, for instance, most of the um, most of the insurance companies, I would say about seventy percent, do outsource. Um, actuaries they um, engage the service of actuarial consultants so how often do you get insurance companies um, coming to you the consulting actuaries for an advice and the um, second question to be if you are to choose between being a consultant actuary and uh, an in-house actuary for an insurance company which one will you advise or which one will you go for thank you so these are all great questions. So for the second question, I will wait for Etienne to present what is uh, being an actuary in an insurance company is, and then I will go back to answer your question. But for the first one, uh, at WTW, we actually have a team that's dedicated to insurance consulting. So them, they develop the um, software that uh, comp insurance company use, so they really they are really consultant for insurance company, and that's a specific line of business. So how, how often does it happen? I would say often enough for us to have a whole line of business that's dedicated to that portion. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, the second one, um, I want to find out like, um, you're already in the field. Um, I, I just want to find out, um, like be working for one specific insurance company and uh, working for a consulting um, actuarial company. You know, which one gives you the flexibility to learn more and also earn more? <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I would say it depends. So the good thing about consulting is that you get a chance to work on different projects. So you will not only be, for example, in your insurance company, you could do pricing, you can do reserving, you can work on specific product compared to in a consulting company, 
you work with different clients that have different needs. So that forces you to learn different things and to learn fast. So it's it's a good thing because you learn a lot, but it's it can also be challenging for some people because you also need to be really organized to make sure that you meet all your client demand. So instead of working in a project that's maybe longer where you have a little bit more time, there's a little bit more time pressure to meet the client demand. So um, personally, I think uh, consulting, but <laughs> I'm working in consulting, so that, I, that might be a bias. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, James. All right, we'll go ahead and let them finish the rest of their slides. If you have any questions, remember to raise your hand and just drop it in the chat. Um, yeah. All right, so we're gonna go over some tasks that, that actually that work in insurance companies do. For instance, like Carmen said earlier, the main task for act actuaries in insurance companies is usually pricing and reserving. Those are the, you know, the bread and butter of insurance company pricing it being being able to price the policies that are being sold by by the insurance companies and reserving being ensuring ensuring that the reserve fund is adequate to cover all future claims. Those are essentially the main tasks of actuaries in those companies. But obviously, there's also other things that actuaries could do at, at, in these companies that usually fits with, within those two buckets. So for instance, uh, there, for certain policies or certain type of policies, the insurance companies need to file their rates with uh, a regulation. They'll be able to approve or dis disprove their, the, the rate changes that they want to implement. And uh, internally, they'll, to, they'll need to do some experience analysis just to make sure that whatever price that they set can cover future claims, and it's they're pro you know the, the rates are profitable, and that they're fair. One of the things that one thing that you'll that you'll see once you start doing exams is that for a rate to be actually sound, it has to, for a rate to be uh, adequate, it has to be actually sound. Uh, fair and non-discriminatory. Non -discriminatory. So those those are things that pricing actuaries have to consider when they when they do the rate filing. Other things they could work on is predictive model calibration. So just being being able to see the impact of the price change on the take up rate of their policy. So for instance, if you have a car car insurance. If you're insured to increase your rate by, let's say, 50%, there's a high likelihood that you will shop around and find something cheaper. Whereas if they were to increase your rate by 1% or 2%, what's the, what's the chance of you uh, leaving that company? So those are all uh, kind of things. Those are all things that, that actuaries I work at insurance company uh, work on, essentially. And the other aspect is being when setting the reserves, so essentially you know, setting an amount that's adequate to cover future claims and also being able to to report the liabilities in, in the financial reports because a lot of these insurance companies, a lot of insurance companies are public companies and there is, you know, regular financial uh, filing that needs to be done. And they're usually done on a quarterly basis. So if you have any friends that are, that are interested, that work in reserving for insurance companies, they'll they'll tell you year end is typically a busy period for actions. Any questions? I think the one thing that I'll add when we think about like um, one question that you said was like the pay difference between insurance and consulting and they all end up kind of leveling out the same i think sometime in insurance you might get a higher salary but not necessarily a bonus whereas in consulting we get um maybe not as much salary but we get bonuses every year um based on like the company and the team's performance um and things like that but in all actuality because we all end up becoming accredited because we all are studying to become ASAs and FSAs, that, that factors a lot into compensation. Um, and it all ends up being pretty, pretty even.
Okay, so uh, I'll walk you through what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So as I said earlier, I'm a international consulting actuary. So what I do is I work with multinational companies. So for example, company ABC that's headquartered in the US, but has operation in France, Germany, uh, the UK, South Africa, and China, for example. So that company is headquartered in the US, but needs someone to oversee the, oper the benefits or the retirement space or m and acquisitions. m and stands for a merger and acquisition uh, in different countries. So on my team, there are people that are focused on m and specifically. So me, I focus more on health and benefit and retirement. So if you look at the graph that's on the right, so there is a purple box, dark purple box. So that's me. That's my team. I stand here. I work with company ABC, that's in blue. And that company has operation in different countries. So they are in the orange box. And them locally, they work with WTW local team. So the team in France, for example, is going to work with local actuaries in France. And these, are, these local actuaries are talking to me to tell me what's going on in the country. And I, that's my job to explain that to the headquarters. So the, um, we do a lot of things based on that principle, but I will focus on two for today. So the first one is global actuarial or uh, global actuarial consolidation. So a company that's headquartered in the United States, if they have a retirement benefit defined benefit plan. So a defined benefit plan, that's a plan that you give to your employee at retirement and that benefit is decided. It's not that employee already know for for example, that they're going to receive $100 a month when they, re when they retire. If the employer offer these kind of benefits, then they need to report liabilities on their balance sheet in the US. And as you can imagine, one company that has operation in a lot of different countries, it means liabilities in a, a lot of different countries. So it can be difficult for the client to understand where they have their liability, how is it calculated, which assumptions are used to calculate these liabilities by actuaries in all the different countries. So on a day-to-day -day basis, me, I work with local actuaries in these different countries to explain to them the, the corporate vision. So for example, an assumption may make sense if you look at France all by itself, but for my client that has operation all over the Eurozone, my client may decide, may say, okay, for the year-end reporting, I would like to have one inflation assumption, for example, for all the region. So I will go back, talk to the local actuary and say, for the, the headquarter, they decided that they want that specific assumption to apply to the whole Eurozone section instead of your specific assumption that you recommended. So my role is really to explain to local actuaries the vision of the headquarter and to the headquarter, the vision of the local actuaries. So that's kind of one part of what I do. And the second part is I work on benefit financing. So the benefit financing is really um, helping multinational manage the cost of employee benefit. So as I mentioned earlier, if you just think about the United States, it costs a lot to provide insurance, health insurance to employees. So multiply that by each, each country in which the employer has employees, then it becomes, a lot, it becomes a lot of costs to manage. So there are tools that the employees, that the employer can use to manage these costs. And one of these tools is to set up an insurance company. So the employer will set up a, an insurance company and that company, the only thing it ensures is this company's benefit. So a large companies, if we take again the example of company ABC, company ABC set up an insurance company and that insurance company, the only thing it does is reinsuring the, the company benefit. They don't go out to get business. Their goal is not really to make profit. It's really to take on the risk of that company. So as you can imagine, having a whole insurance company on the side that's not part of your main business can be really challenging. So that's where we come in as actuaries to help them. So some actuaries work on the reserving. Me, we help them with, first of all, do a feasibility study. So is it really feasible for me to set up an insurance company for my benefit? So we help them analyze the risk in every country, make sure that that's still applicable. Or we help them evaluate, oh, we have a policy in France, for example, a life policy in France. Is, does it make sense to bring that in our own insurance company? So that's 
kind of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So in two world, I talk a lot. <laughs> I'm on the phone a lot with local actuaries all over the world. And I kind of understand from a high level perspective what they do in the different countries. So does anybody ask questions to what I do? Uh, yes, Greg? Yes, uh, uh, simple question. You mentioned uh, talking to um, the international uh, clients on the phone and things like that. Does it often call or does it occasionally call for you to travel to where they are? Do y'all meet in a particular country or anything like that? Or is it just straight phone calls, Zoom calls and things like that? <laughs> Uh, so I joined that team during the pandemic, so obviously I didn't travel much, but even prior to the pandemic, since, as I mentioned, my team is, um, I work with uh, clients that are headquartered in the U.S. So my clients tend to be around, I'm in the New York City area, so my clients tend to be around New York City. Uh, I don't, I wish I would travel more, <laughs> but I talk, I talk on the phone or I'm in conference call a lot with local actuaries all over the world. But we, senior consultant especially, are, are traveling a little bit more than what I do as a um, more junior colleague on the team. But I would say that our call are mainly with people that are in the United States. So we don't travel as much internationally. Thanks, Greg. Any other questions? Michael? Yeah. Do you use any math on a daily basis? Um, that's a great question. So is, is the question, do I do integral on the side? Uh, no, I do not. But I would say we apply the principle that you use. So you don't do manual calculation. But for example, when I mentioned the pension benefits, so the liability that are calculated. So we calculate the liability. The liability are calculated based on actuarial principle. So you need to understand how these things are calculated to be able to understand the impacts, especially at a high level. So we need to understand that, for example, um, if it's a present value, then the interest rate, as the interest rate were increasing this year, then we were expecting large gains on the liability. So if you don't know how to calculate it, then it's hard to estimate the impact. So do I do hard calculation on a day-to-day -day basis? I would say no, but if you don't know how to calculate it, it may be hard to explain or to understand how, how it's done on the software. Uh, do you also um, use any probability? Um, I would say like probability, yes. So mortality probability. So for example, the retirement benefit I was talking about or for life insurance, then you need to calculate the probability that somebody else that somebody would die within the next year, for example, to evaluate the cost of providing life insurance. So that's probably probability in a sense, but not necessarily the um, dice game that you heard that you learn in for exam P. But it's still the principle still applies. So I would say more the plans the principle than actually actual calculations. All right, thank you. All right. Um, sorry, I lost track of who raised their hand first again. Um, so, Jane, since you're off mute, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Okay, thank you. Um, here's a quick one. I want to find out how do you ensure um, the credibility of the information the local um, actuaries provide you? How do you ensure that those information are credible? That's that's a great question, and that's actually a big portion of my of my job is to ensure that the information provided makes sense at a high level. So we always tell the client we rely on the information that's provided to us, but we do we do high level checks. So for example, like I mentioned earlier, if you know how things are calculated, you can kind of estimate the impact based on the information that they provide us. So if they provide you with data, so census data, for example, and if you do your their calculation, it doesn't match what they provided you. So for example, the population increased a lot, but the liability decreased. That's the kind of thing that you can check and ask the local actuary to verify, or you can ask more questions with the local actuary. So I would say it's through ver verification, but also through discussions with local actuaries in the different countries to understand the assumption that they were used, that they used, or where, where they, they came up with the data that they provided us. 
-hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Thanks, James. Um, Steve, did you want to go next and then we'll do Tommy? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, talked about a lot about assumptions, right? And, and so um, you said that assumptions play a big role in um, calculations and, and talking to clients. Has there ever been, I guess, a scenario where an important assumption has been like, I guess, tossed aside by a client and that we affected the outcome of a project? And then how would you go about negotiating that pushback from the client without telling them it's a bit of your fault? I just want to see how, because it's bound to happen, I'm assuming. So I just want to see, has that ever happened? And how were you able to like navigate and, and work through that? Well, uh, that's a great question. Uh I would say it depends. So some assumptions are set by law. So the, the client doesn't really have a say of how, how it is calculated. So the, the law would say the discount rate needs to be calculated based on these factors. But for other assumption, and that's where we have assumption discussion with the client, so things like salary increase. At the end of the day, the client knows how much they're planning to increase, what's their philosophy over increasing salary over time. So they have a say in that assumption. So that's why we are here to advise them, but at the end of the day, that's the decision. So I would say sometimes there are clients that are more involved and they are with push back on some assumptions. So we just, we want to make sure that the assumptions are reasonable, but there's a range to reasonability and depending on the client goal and on the client vision on these assumptions, then um, the outcome may change. So one thing I'll add to that is our clients really look at us as like trusted advisors. So they, if we're telling them something, they're usually like they'll ask questions and they want to understand. But a lot of times at the end, they'll say, okay, like you're the expert and I'll like trust your guidance. And um, we as actuaries are signing off on the results. Um, so if assumption is way out of whack, like if, let's say we think something should be 5% and they think it should be like 30%, we'll say like, this isn't reasonable. You know, we can't sign off on this because these, these resu results aren't like we we don't we wouldn't sign something that we we know is just going to be like completely incorrect but sometimes clients do like to set assumptions more aggressively um and they're and they're allowed to do that as long as it's reasonable and it's it's usually a conversation back and forth perfect i hope that answered your question Steven, Steven. Perfect. Okay. And then Tommy, did you want to go ahead and oh Steve? I'm letting Steve back in. He left. I think he was having some issues. So he may have missed that. Uh, but it's recorded. So hopefully he uh, can watch it later. <laughs> uh, Tommy, if you want to go ahead and ask your question as well. Okay. Um so just because somebody asks about the um, kind of math you'd be doing while that work, also I just want to know: is it? I mean, what kind of um, software? I mean, programming software do you use? And and I probably know you using um, Excel spreadsheets, but what other software do you use um, on your day to day? That's a great question. So on my end, I, I use Excel spreadsheets on a day to day. We also have like some valuation software that were developed by WTW that are not necessarily things that are available on the market. That's kind of a in-house software for calculation. And that's mainly what we use on my team, but on different team, they use different software. So that's actually a great way for me to introduce the next subject, which is what Etienne does on a day to day. And in his line of work, there is a lot more programming, for example, in R than what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, one more question. Um, so uh, I'm just, so I'm, I'm getting two things right now. So it seems um, an actuarial worker could either be more, let's say more business oriented in a certain sense and some are more analytical or more analytical in, in a certain sense. I mean, I, I guess, I mean, an actual worker could be, could have both qualities, but I'm just saying, I think it seems some are more business oriented, some are more maybe analytical. So um, let's say you're like going for like an interview with, with maybe WTW. I mean, 
is it does it i mean how do you express okay your personality is more uh, i prefer the business roles over let's say analytical, analytical roles i prefer or i prefer the analytical roles over the business roles. how do you maybe express yourself in that way that this is this is where you're at this is what you um, want to do yeah, that, that's a great question. I would say by looking at, first of all, by looking at job offer. So through the job description, I think we typically do a good job of explaining what the role is. So through the through what's explained in the job description, you'll be able to see, is it something that I would like to do if I was hired to do that? So that will give you more insight. Or is it going to be a heavy, heavy programming internship or full-time job? Or is it going to be more business oriented? Um, type of role. So I would say, depending on the job offer, first of all, and then as you get in the role, you will see what what you like more. So for example, as when I was a, t a student, I didn't really know that I will end up in consulting. I tried it, I like it. And then on a day to day basis, there's things I like more, there's things I like less. So through that, I kind of forging my career path, and I kind of decide which type of role I'm, I want to I want to have at the company. So I would say it's not necessarily a decision that you need to make day one as you enter the field, but it's more uh, something that comes to you as you continue working and based on your interest as well. Thank you for your questions, everyone. That was great. We are you know, approaching time, so I do wanna give them enough time to finish presenting all the slides and everything. Uh, so you can go ahead and and finish up Carmen and I'll be sending out some additional messaging after this. Okay. Yeah. All right, so now we're gonna talk about um, what my day looks like and the team I work, I work in. So I'm part of the risk and analytic team at WTW. What we do is we help clients quantify and manage risk across a broad range of industries that usually include uh, healthcare, retail, hospitality, most of my time is spent working on analyses for the loyalty programs. Um, usually I would, I would ask you if you know of, of any loyalty programs, but I know we don't have much time. So loyalty programs are essentially programs like Air Miles, Aeroplan, any of your favorite airlines or hosp or um, not hospital, hotel, hotel chains. So whenever you you get points or you get miles or whatever, what's some kind of tool that you can use to redeem to get free stuff later on, like at Starbucks, I think they started one recently as well. So what would I, what uh, we do essentially is that with all those points or all those free things that are given to you with, through these programs, there's a cost associated to, the, to them. And at the end of the year, at, at a different point in time throughout the year, companies that have these kind of programs, they need to estimate the portion of the outstanding balance that will eventually be redeemed so they're able to set their liabilities. Us at WTW, we've developed a loyalty advisor framework in which we use machine learning algorithms to value the liability associated to the loyalty program by estimating uh, future redemptions. And using this that, that same framework, we're able to, to help clients manage their liabilities by analyzing what if scenarios and the associated cost of changing small things in your program. So for instance, um, during the whole pandemic, a lot of a lot of pro, a lot of like loyalty programs stopped exp expiring points, and because of that, there's a, a you know a large portion of points that usually would be expired and removed from the liabilities that that still remain outstanding, and that puts some that usually puts some pressure on the the company's liability. So, it's before companies do these kind of changes, they all, they want to be prepared. To, to see the impact of, or the cost impact of making those changes. And, and that's what we're recommending to help them make, um, at least and, and analyze the, the estimated impact of making those, those changes. And lastly, we also help clients optimize their liabilities by evaluating the cost slash benefit trade-off of their program. Because having a loyalty program brings you future revenue, but it also has a cost associated to, to it. So we help our clients find an optimal economic value of uh, each of their members and we'll find ways to, to improve their offering to increase future revenues and 
and minimize the, the costs associated with, with these programs. So again, to, to use um, all that, those, to be able to, to do, the, do this analysis, that's where you see the, the, the intersection of the actuarial science, the loyalty program expertise and data science all put together. And that's what uh, me and my team, we, we work on. That's what, like, what I usually do for most of my day, but there's also other people on my team that also work on the regular insurance stuff and cover different kind of line of business, such as asbestos, auto liability, cyber, uh, general liability, property warranty, and workers' compensation. And professional liability is a big, is a big player as well. Any questions on, on what I do? Yes, Miles. Um, in like the data science portion of the actuarial field, how common is it to use machine learning programs? I, I feel, I feel like it's more common in, in the PNC realm, but it probably is common as well in the health and benefit uh, side of things. But based based on what I know, I, it's pretty common in the property and casualty world because I know there's a lot of insurance companies that are using that to be able to estimate how a, a claim will develop in the future because there's obviously certain types of claims that will have a larger associated cost to them compared to other uh, claims so for instance a fender bender versus the um what's that word when a car is total there's a you know, there, there's different costs associated and companies would want to usually use um machine learning or any kind of um predictive model to be able to to identify early enough the claim is that could end up being a total loss versus a small fender bender. Thank you. No problem. Are there any more qu questions about the day to day? Thank you, Miles, for that question. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. And now there, there's also a lot of non-traditional lecture roles. Uh, what like what Carmen, Anjane, and La, and I do, it's uh, pretty typical for actuaries. So basically, working in a consult a consulting a, in a consulting environment or working for insurance companies, and we we usually work on insurance programs. But there's actuaries in other roles. So for instance, um, there's actuaries that work on pet insurance, which is still related to insurance, but it's a different kind of insurance that wasn't as uh, prevalent, you know, a few, 10 to 10 to 20 years ago. There's actuaries that serve as expert witness in court proceedings. Personally, personally I know the, of actuaries that work in the sports industry, notably doing a sports betting analytics in which they use their actuarial skills to predict sports events, such as whether who's gonna win the game tonight, like who's gonna win the Super Bowl, how much points are going to be scored, the over and under, and all that stuff. And also, there's also actuaries that help companies set the odds for their for for odd makers or people that uh, have uh, these sports books and help them manage the risk associated with having all these all these bets that are open or up and outstanding. Any questions on uh, on these kind of roles? Yes, Sandra. I do have a question concerning wealth management and financial planning. Do you have a um, couple of examples of how actuary, uh, actuaries are helping in that uh, sector? Thank you. Um, one of the roles that I had uh, in, like one of the internships I, I did was with the this uh, pension plan. And what we, what we did essentially is we ran um, a lot of different simulations of different things that could happen in the market. So, so for instance, if inflation goes up or down, what impact will it have on the, the book of business? And it was for a pension company. So these things have an impact on, on um, the liabilities, essentially. So basically, 
what we did is we worked on different uh, asset and liability management. So being able to see the impact of different changes of different metrics in the, in the, in the economy, whether it's the inflation, their investment returns, um, changes in retail, any impact of, let's say, COVID or any extreme events, what impact would it have on, uh, on, your, on your assets, stress testing, just basically, just to, just to basically to ensure that you're able to to withstand to withstand any event essentially. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. All right. Okay. So going on to the next slide. So we just wanted to add a few things about what you should work, what you should, what you should look for when you, you look at the company to work for. So we, we posted a few things here, but I think this can be applicable to our company, but also to any company that you're looking to be hired for either an internship or a full-time position. So you want a place that is gonna be intellectually challenging. So somewhere where you can learn, uh, have a flexible career uh, that has a collaborative culture, especially starting at entry level position. You want to make sure that you have experienced colleagues that are there to guide you and to walk you through uh, the ropes of the work. So obviously in school and through exam, we learn a lot, but it's a lot of in-person on the job training that needs to be done. So it's, it's good to look, at the, to look for a company that has that kind of culture. Also, um, client interaction, it can be internal, external. So internal client would be the stakeholders in the different projects that you work for. So we mentioned reserving or pricing. These pricing help companies, help insurance company internally with profitability. So it might be that the finance team on that scenario is kind of your internal client. And external client is, as you mentioned, uh, Etienne and I are working for client that hire WTW, so that would be external um, client. Then there is uh, the training and the ability to network internally and externally. It's really good to network and to try to know more actuary, especially early on, because it can help you with your career. And also, I felt like it helped me a lot with the exam process. So meeting other actuaries, they kind of give me tips to study, or what should I take first, things that I wouldn't have known by myself. Go to the next slide. Um, this is really a quick slide on what we have um, as opening at WTW. So we have a graduate graduated role. So these are entry level position for students, specifically for students. And we also have uh, internships that are posted for all our different teams. So that's typically, um, I did two internships for WTW before being hired full-time. And the thing that I found great about the internship program is that you work on real cases. So you're not assigned to specific project for intern, you're really part of client teams that work on real projects. So what you would do on a day-to-day -day basis is also what people on your team do on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, to quickly walk you through our, uh, application process. I know uh, each company kind of has its differences. Uh, oh, Michael, do you have a question? Yeah, is WTW in Canada? Uh, yes, I used to work for WTW Canada. Uh, so our process is kind of a three-step process. So. We have the online application where uh, you enter your resume that's kind of been uh, reviewed by someone on our team. Then we would send a higher view assessment to um, a few candidates that we find interesting. So that higher view assessment is something you can do on your own at home. It's a few questions where you send us videos. So we review these videos and then you part to the, you are on to the next phase of the interview where you will be contacted by someone on our team to have a live interviews.
a great point that uh, Angeli just posted it into the chat that uh, the W2B is a global company and that uh, we are we can basically join us by anywhere. And uh, Tommy, I believe you have a question. Um, so um, on the previous slide, you talked. I mean, you talked about um, graduate programs and for internship. So I think um, that means you're not looking for people that are probably trying to maybe career changers and all that stuff. Does that does that does that what it means? Uh, no, it would actually fit in the graduate full time program, um, uh, entry level program. So. We have entry level world. So as a career changer, most likely people don't have experience in the field. So it would be more of a entry level role. So that would be um, put in the title. But we have roles specifically for people who recently graduated and we have entry level role as well that are available for anyone just starting in the profession. And for, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna think we're gonna say the same thing. I was just gonna say we have roles for people who are experienced as well. So if you've been working as an actuary already for three years or five years or 25 years, um, WTW has 40,000 employee, employees. Um, so we, we, have, we have a lot of positions open always. Yes, yes. And if they have any additional questions, um, would they be able to is appreciate to ask? Oh, sorry. Oh, is it appropriate to ask how billing works? I don't know. Uh, billing clients, you mean? Is that what you mean, Adrian? Like, are they paid? Oh, are they paid hourly? Oh, for no. internships. So my question was, um, so I was, I was just asking, you know, you know, like in suits when they're talking about maintaining billable hours, <laughs> that's what I was, that's what I was trying yeah. to ask. Uh, that's a good question. So depending, depending on the team within the WTW, the billing system will work differently, but um, we are providing services. So yes, typically there is a billing rate that that's, that is associated to the services that we provide to our clients. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, Michael, you can go ahead and uh, ask your question. Yeah, so in your interview, would they ask any technical questions? I, I would say it depends on the team and also depends on the role. So knowing that most of the roles, for example, for an intern, we are not expecting you to have the technical knowledge of someone who's been in the industry for 10 years. So depending on the team, they will ask you, uh, for example, what type of uh, software do you know? Or if in that specific situation, what would, what would you do? Which technique would you use, for example? But it's not, from what I've seen, it's not a tricky question. It's more to understand What's your level with, for example, the different software or the different actuarial concepts? Okay, hope that helps, Michael. We have two more people and then we'll go ahead and uh, just wrap it up. So, because I want everybody to also get good sleep, eat your dinner, all of that. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll take Nicole. Thanks. Um, I have two questions. Um, I just, for the, I guess, like entry level portion, how important are like grades, I guess, for, um, for like recent graduates and how many roles can you apply to in like the entry level position? So I would say uh, the number of roles you can apply to, I think it's at least. I don't think the system is gonna stop you from applying for every single role. I think it's more, they might ask you, why did you apply for that position? So you need to make sure you know the role before applying if you apply to multiple ones, because they will most likely ask you, why do you want to be on your team? But I've done it in the past. You can be transparent and say, for example, I've applied to HNB, but I'm also interested in retirement. So I also applied on retirement. So that's, that's not an issue. I would say uh, in terms of grades, um, we have um, minimum threshold 
that we look at for grades. So I, I think below that minimum threshold, threshold, I think the system sent you an, an automatic rejection, but I don't think that threshold is um, specifically high, but I think grades are also a good way to stand out among other students. So um, I would say we looked at a variety of things. So experience, um, kind of this, uh, what's, what type of resume the person has, but the grades are also part of that whole review that we do. And the higher view assessment is also part of that. So through the answer that are provided through the higher view assessment is also a way that we use to evaluate candidates. Yeah, and uh, Nicole, she dropped, Ajane dropped in the chat, uh, the GPA, oh, gotcha. Just wanna make sure you see it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Ajane. Yeah, so we have one more question. We'll go ahead and let Doris and ask her question. He or she, the one assume. <clears throat> yes, thank you for letting me know, letting me uh, ask my question. I have the question about the entry level. I want to know if uh, her company uh, uh, as a new graduate, is it possible to apply for the entry uh, for the entry level without an exam? Uh, I would say yes. I think exam are a good way to differentiate differentiate yourself. So, as you can imagine, for all these entry level positions, there's a lot of people that are applying. So, I would say uh, exam is a good way to stand out amongst amongst other candidates but it's not something that's going to stop you from applying or that it's going to lead you to an automatic rejection, for example, if you don't have an exam. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, Perfect. for, um, for yeah. the roles that are on the screen, all the... Is she breaking up for you all too? Okay, I, was in, I thought that was just me and my computer. Um, not actuarial roles don't require any exam. Oh, sorry. I said exams aren't required for the non actuarial roles. Perfect. Thank you, Ajane. She has always been a great resource for information. I love Ajane. Um, yes. So if you all have any more questions or anything regarding uh, full time or internship positions, you can definitely reach out to me and I can get you all connected um, to either Carmen, Etienne, or uh, Ajane. My mind was blanking for a second. So yes, um, but that is the end of our presentation for tonight. That is the end of our module one, our session one. So give a big round of applause to yourself because we have finally gotten through uh, session one. So up on the screen right here as well, we do have some other things going on this month here at IABA. Um, so as you're applying to WTW, you can also be looking at IABA programs and what we have going on and events. Um, I, I know some people ask about exams. We have our exam prep program, uh, informational on Monday. So please, please, please be on the lookout for like all these different events and informational sessions that we have. Uh, and lastly, to wrap up, I will be sending out information and in, uh, that information. I'll be sending out the recording to this, uh, all the information that you may need regarding um, next session and all of that. So I'll be sending that email out to you next week. And if you all have any questions, please let me know, email me at any time. And I look forward to seeing you February 22nd, 2023. Um, for our next session. And Carmen, is there another slide to this? Yep. If you need to get connected at all, here are the QR codes for our student-centric e-blasts, social media, whatever. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and end our session for tonight. If you have any questions, like I said, just email me. Oh, sorry. There are some people that are inboxing me right now, just email me, please. And um, I'll help you get acquainted or get, you know, your answers for what you need. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. You have a good one. Thank you so thank much, you. everyone. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Thank you.
go ahead and type in Charlie. All right, thank you guys, thank you. Thank you, thank you, night, night. Night, night, night. <laughs> Who was this? Did you get my email? Um, let me type it again because that was the wrong email at blackactuaries.org. Thank you. Appreciate the information. Okay, perfect. All right, guys. You all have a good rest of your night. Stay safe. And I'll see you February 22nd. All right. Bye.